Hello, hello, hello. This is going to be an interesting video, but I'll try to keep it concise. So I've seen so much interest in angels, um, specifically, but lots of pieces of the Abrahamic faiths lately in the pagan and witchy community. And I think it's important to not discount any religion on this planet, including the Abrahamic faiths. So I'm going to be speaking from a Christian perspective here, pulling on Christian um, folklore and mythology, because that's what I know. That's what I was raised in. Uh, I do plan on making two other companion videos to this about how angels are seen from other uh, Abrahamic views, such as Judaism, but those will come later. So this is what are angels according to the Holy Bible, which is the sacred text of Christianity. Now within Christianity, there is Catholicism and Protestantism, and I will be speaking from Protestantism because also that's what I was raised in, that is what I know. I do have many notes uh, and windows pulled up to help me speak on this because it is something that I take very seriously and want to speak on as knowledgeably as possible. So, what are angels point blank? What you have seen in popular culture now is an, an um, amalgamation of a lot of different ideas as it is with pretty much everything in Christianity and as it is with anything that goes on for a long period of time. Everyone contributes ideas to the great idea. You know what I mean? And that's good. That's how things stay valid and current in a culture. Otherwise they die out and disappear. Only if everyone from all over gets to add in their ideas of what, in this instance, an angel looks like, sounds like, what they do, um, does it continue to grow and become something, you know, culturally relevant like it is today. But, scrap all that, <laughs> and let's look at specifically just the Holy Bible. So, with that said, you probably have seen lately, it's become very popular, all of these memes and gifs and images of what an angel really looks like according to the Bible. And it is always not just a Aryan looking person with a white toga and or a robe and wings, right? That's what we've been sold. But according to the Bible, they don't necessarily look like that. And you've been seeing this a lot online, I'm sure. You've been seeing the image of like multiple rings all entwined, kind of like the opening of Game of Thrones, <laughs> and with flames and like hundreds of eyes on it. And it says something like, be not afraid, sis. <laughs> I'm sure we've all seen that. I'm sure we've seen the images of like the child being like, I'm going to pray for my guardian angel. <laughs> and this multiple intertwined metal rings of spinning flames and a hundred eyeballs appear to the child. We've all, we've seen that lately. And that is somewhat biblically true, but not completely. But you're on the right path. So, in the Bible, uh, what we know about angels comes mostly from the Old Testament. Now, in Protestantism, specifically in the Protestantism I was raised in, the Church of Christ, while you can look at the Old Testament and learn from it and treat them as parables, that's it's the Old Testament. It's not really a book that we hold as the current living teachings, right? We really want to just focus on the New Testament because that's all about Jesus Christ because he doesn't even show up in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is all about Abraham and Moses, but that is where we get the majority of our stuff about angels. So um, we're not speaking on angelology here. We're not pulling from the Kabbalah, as I said. We're not pulling from um, any kind of like satanic um, views on angels, any of that, because I'm sure we're all familiar with like archangels and seraphims and like all the different types of angels. Some of that is from the Bible and we'll, see, we'll I will show you. So ultimately, what is an angel? 
in terms of the Holy Bible. An angel is many things. It seems to be something that was created before God created man on earth. Okay? So God created the heavens and the earth. It says that in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. But we can kind of assume that he must have created the heavens or heaven first before he created the earth, right? And he must have created angels first because of things that we get later on in the Bible that kind of insinuate or flat out tell us that angels have existed before humans. And in some cases, angels lust after humans or they get angered by humans and they're jealous of humans. That's where we get Lucifer, a.k.a. Satan, a.k.a. the devil. He was an angel one of God's closest angels, which according to the Bible would probably be what we call an archangel. These are like the top tier angels. Um, they are name dropped in the Bible, but we'll get to that. So assuming that Lucifer probably was an archangel, however, he might also be a cherubim, but we'll get to that later. He's a very close ally of God, and we are told that in the book. In, in the good book. But he becomes jealous once God creates man. And he despises them. And this causes, among other things, this causes him to be cast out from heaven and fall into hell. So he is a fallen angel. And there is scripture saying that there are other fallen angels, but that's not important. We're focusing on the good angels for this video. So, ultimately an angel is a uh, messenger of God. It helps deliver God's words to humans. Because in some, not necessarily in the Bible, but in some views of Christianity, of God, um, direct communication with God is kind of not impossible at all because God does speak to a ton of people in the Bible directly but it is kind of like seen as like special that that's a special thing a special occasion and sometimes in some sects of Protestant Christianity you were taught that direct communication with God is not possible because you wouldn't be able to comprehend or understand God's messaging to you directly and it might make you go a little crazy that's why we have people like preachers or ministers or pastors or use a label here to be middlemen between us and God, to help get God's message to us, right? And so it's much like that with angels. Angels come down to people, usually special people, like a prophet or a preacher, a priest, something like that, but sometimes to everyday people, and get a message across from God. So they're messengers. However, sometimes they are also described as being the army of God. So they are Entities that help fight against the dark forces of Lucifer, a.k.a. the devil, a.k.a. Satan. So they are warriors too, right? They're these entities that help fight back the forces of darkness. So messengers, warriors, what else is an angel according to the Bible? Well, I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. An angel according to the Bible... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. They're, well, they are also sometimes protectors of humans, which is where we get into the guardian angel thing, but we'll talk about that too. So sometimes they are protectors of humanity, of God's creation at large, sometimes not just people, sometimes like places um, or things. But you get the idea of what an angel is essentially now. Um, they're warriors, they're God's right hand people. They are messengers. Okay, so within the Bible, we do get name dropped some angels. Now, I know that like in the Kabbalah and other research you probably have done, you've learned about the names of lots of different angels that are usually archangels, like, you know, Uriel and um, Samuel, and like, there's a lot, and they all did usually like El. <laughs> Now, that's not necessarily really in the Bible. In the Bible, we do learn about Gabriel and we learn about Michael. Specifically, those two come up a couple of times. Um, <clears throat> now, Gabriel 
is seen as an archangel. Again, now archangels, um, let me just bring up my notes so I speak correctly. Um, oh, okay, excuse me, I've misspoken. Let's sideline Gabriel, Michael. Michael is name dropped as an archangel and he is the only angel in the Bible referred to as an archangel, to my knowledge. And that is Michael. We don't know the specifics about what makes an archangel an archangel, but he is name dropped as an archangel. He's sometimes called a chief prince of heaven. So infer there what an archangel is. Um, but I think we can assume that an, an there are angels and then there are archangels. And there's are just like kind of if if angels are warriors in an army of God, then archangels are like the generals, the very special angels. And Michael is one of those. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, Michael is important because he he leads God's army, the whole army, against Satan's forces in the book of Revelation, which is the final battle between heaven and hell. That's it. It's the rapture, right? So when that happens, according to the Bible, because it hasn't happened yet, Michael will be leading the forces of good against the forces of evil. And ultimately, we already know that Michael will win. His forces will win. They will defeat the darkness. Um, <clears throat> but that's complicated, as is much of the Bible. Um, he... I'm trying to see what he specifically did, because I'm getting him confused with Gabriel, and I don't want to do that to you. I think that might be his biggest thing in the Bible. I think. Let's see. Just want to make sure that I'm speaking correctly. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So, <clears throat> let me check one more note. <laughs> okay, so pretty much yes. Okay, thank you. Now, if I'm not mistaken, now let's move on to Gabriel, because that pretty much sums up archangels. That's really. <laughs> That's really all we know about them. Okay. So, moving on to Gabriel. Alright. So, Gabriel is an angel who comes up several many times. And yes, this is the angel I'm thinking of. So, Gabriel comes up in the Gospels of Luke. He comes up in the book of Daniel. Um, I think this is the two books he comes up in. I think, maybe just those two, uh, the book of Daniel and the book of Luke, or the gospel of Luke and the gospel of Daniel. And he appears to Daniel uh, to explain a whole bunch of visions that Daniel is receiving from God. So again, going back to what I said before, sometimes God in the Bible can send you messages, but you might not be able to interpret them or understand them. I think we as warlocks, witches, and whatever can experience that too, right? You may be receiving messages from the other side, from your ancestors, from spirits, from the gods you work with, but you don't fully comprehend what they're trying to tell you. And that happens with Christianity as well. So God sends a bunch of visions to Gabriel, I mean to um, Daniel, and the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel to help explain what those visions were. So he comes down and he's like, God sent you some messages. Let's just be clear about what that was. Okay? We don't want no confusion. <laughs> so he explains what the visions are. Well, in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, which is a separate book in the Bible, he comes to this man named Zechariah. Not Zechariah, but Zechariah. <laughs> And Zechariah is, like, very old, like, wrinkly old, okay? And he comes to him to say, you know, you're going to have a son. And I'm just telling you now, be prepared. Because I know you're super old and you probably think you can't do that anymore. <laughs> but you can. not You're going to have a son. And that son is going to be someone very important. And we've chosen you to, you know, help with this. That happens a lot in the Bible. <laughs> um... So he, that his son becomes John the Baptist, who is a very important character, um, side note, who 
introduces the concept of baptism, which is, you know, being washed in water and forgiven for your sins, right? Which is the thing in Christianity. But that's a whole other conversation. Because before that, they were stabbing animals to, to uh, get rid of their sins, to be forgiven for their sins. It's wild. And, yeah, John the Baptist is like, well, how about we just dunk ourselves in water? But anyway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he comes to Zechariah and imparts that message from God saying, you're going to have a child who's very important. Uh, he comes to Daniel to explain the visions that God has given Daniel. And he very famously comes to Mary, just like he did with Zechariah, to say, hey, you're going to have a child, and that child is very important. Now, he comes to Mary, the Virgin Mary, to say, you're going to have this child named Jesus Christ, and or Jesus, and he is going to be the Christ child. He's going to be the anointed one. He's going to be the Son of God. And he, you're going to receive this child through immaculate conception, which means that you're going to receive this child without physical intercourse. Okay? So Zechariah, excuse me, so Gabriel is a very important angel for that alone. He's a very important messenger. He, he delivers messages that are very important. <laughs> okay? Now, um, going back to angels at large, the different types of angels in the Bible, okay? Now, there are angels that are not named that go to speak with Jesus after he is in the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, after he's tempted by the devil. Some angels come to help Jesus because Jesus is at a very low point. He's exhausted. He's hungry. You know, they tend to him. So again, this goes back to the idea that angels are messengers for God, warriors for God, but also do help humans. They help take care of us and protect us. And they help, you know, like I said, be the middleman between us and God. Now, the different types of angels in the Bible, we did talk about archangels like Michael. These are just super special angels, like generals of God's army, etc. Um, angels that are probably in the inner circle with God, <laughs> if you want to think of it like that. And I just want to make sure that I'm getting you everything that I've written down. Um, yes, 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 and yes, and yes, Zechariah, yes, John the Baptist, yes, Virgin Mary, yes. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm not leaving things out. So, lastly, going about, as I said, the different types of Bible uh, angels. So, the archangel we discussed... And then you have something called seraphim. A singular form is a seraph. Now, a seraphim is only mentioned twice in the entire Holy Bible. And that is in the Old Testament as well. And that is in, um, I think it's the book of Isaiah. E no, 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 excuse me. Is there a book of Isaiah? Yes, but no, not in that. It is in Deuter. oh. Yeah, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, and um, the book of, what is it? Uh, numbers, the book of Numbers, Numbers, the book of Numbers. <laughs> and they're described, uh, no, 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 yes, hang on, I'm getting ahead of myself. So they're described in the book of Isaiah twice, name dropped as Seraphim, but they are later described further in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy, okay? So, there we go. So... A seraphim is also a, a special type of angel, and it is usually in God's throne room. So again, these are very special angels, but not like in the sense of an archangel, which are like generals. These are like angels that God trusts very well, and he's like, go do my stuff for me. Seraphim are more kind of like God's footmen or handmaidens type of thing and they tend to him they're in very much like in the throne room of heaven right and as the bible says specifically it does say that they are in the throne god's throne in the temple of heaven seraphim are described as having six wings uh, visually these are my favorite angels by the way as you saw from the thumbnail <laughs> but um they have six wings two of them wrap around to cover their eyes or their whole face and uh, two wrap around to cover their feet, and two are used just for, like, to extend and to fly, I suppose. 
And they do have hands. Seraphim have hands. That's important to note. So they are more humanoid. And they pro they they're like announcers. Like they kind of are always just coming to it. If God if angels are messengers, right? Then Seraphim are like the ones who are like his hype men. Like they're like, God is great. Whoop whoop. Like <laughs> they always come to announce his holiness to people, to announce his literally from the heavens that will shout out like god is great bitch like in case you forgot like they're just they're his hype men as i said and his caregivers and one of them does play a part in forgiving isaiah of a sin that he commits but that's like a whole kind of other tangent story because usually only god forgives people of sins um so i guess in that sense if we want to pull on that tangent I guess sometimes angels, specifically a seraph, can act on the part of God sometimes, supposedly, maybe, perhaps. Um, they are also described as burning ones or as flying serpents. So they might not even have human bodies, but they do have hands. So we might think of them as like six-winged snakes that are on fire that have human hands sticking out. Maybe, right? If we want to go off of all that imagery. Who knows? Who knows what they look like? Uh, but as much as we can pull from the Bible, that's what they would be. They'd be like a serpent with six wings. Obviously, it has to have some kind of feet because the wings cover the feet. And then they have to have hands because they are described as having hands. Um, and they have some kind of a human or some type of a face because the wings cover their face. It's fascinating and terrifying. But angels are described over and over and over in the Bible as terrifying. <laughs> or as unsettling, which is interesting. But again, if they are warriors for God, it makes sense. They're fighting against the dark forces. On the battlefield, you want to look terrifying. We see that in our actual secular history, meaning non-religious. Um, you know, we have war paint, battle cries to try to make ourselves seem more intimidating and scary to the enemy. So it makes sense that God's angels fighting the forces of darkness would want to look scarier than the forces of darkness, which have to look terrifying because hello demons. <laughs> so, uh, yes, that's essentially, essentially what Seraph, that's it that we know about seraphs, seraphim. Uh, uh, now, they do seem to be perhaps maybe really special in terms of children because there is an instance where um, angels are, like, protecting children, but they've also come to cast judgment on children, which, again, going back to, like, perhaps it seems that seraphim are different from the other classes of angels, the other two angels, well, three angels in the Bible because they can act on God's behalf. They can cast judgments. They can forgive sins. So that's kind of fancy and special. And I just think that they look really cool given how they're described. <laughs> so um, moving on, there are cherubim, singular cherubs. Now you've heard of cherubs. Um, Cupid from Valentine's Day, right? He's usually seen as a cherub. But what you know is a cherub is a lie. So normally you think of a cherub and you think, oh, those are the angels that are infants, right? Like little, literally little infant human babies with little wings that fly around. And usually at Valentine's Day have the bow and arrow. That's a lie, <laughs> at least biblically speaking, okay? Again, we're speaking from the Christian Bible. That's a lie. There are no infant angels described in the Bible. However, cherubim and cherubs are name dropped in the Bible, but they are, we are told how they look and it is not like babies. It's something more terrifying. So they show up, oh, excuse me, I bit my lip. They show up, I think more than any other angel in the Bible. Cause again, archangels only named once with Michael. Seraphim is named only twice. Cherubims are named uh, I wrote it down. 33 times in the Bible. 33 times, but only in the Old Testament. But there are 33 times that an angel is specifically called a cherub or a cherubim. Okay? And the Ezekiel, 
who is a prophet, who's a little crazy, but he's a prophet of God. And now when we say a prophet of God, that's just someone who gets messages from God, has visions, premonitions. You get the gist. They're a very special, special chosen person from God that receives visions from God. Both good and bad, usually bad. <laughs> and they receive warnings from God a lot of the time. So Ezekiel gives us a huge description in his book. He has his own gospel um, where he describes cherubim specifically in great detail. Like, great detail. So, this is how he... But in a convoluted, complicated way. This is how he describes them. So, in Ezekiel 1, 10, he describes them as having... <laughs> Multiple faces. He At one point he names them as with four faces. Another time he says they have two faces. So four faces. A face of a man, a, fi a face of an ox, a face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. All on one body. Okay? Another time he says that there are four faces. That of a man, a lion, an eagle, and a cherub. But this is a cherub, so that's where it's complicated. Another time he says they have two faces, just that of a man and a lion. Um, but when he describes them, he's describing a vision, um, not necessarily seeing the angel itself. It's the vision of an angel. So, you know, interpret that how you like. But um, <clears throat> he says that they do generally have a humanoid form. So they are probably the closest to what we see in modern artwork of like a human angel. And they have legs with calves feet, like a feet of a calf, a baby cow. Uh, they have human hands, but more than two, usually four hands, but he doesn't say they have multiple arms. So I wonder if they do have like four hands that come off of one arm, I don't know. He says that they have four wings and two of them cover their bodies. Again, we have this, and the other two are extended for flight, I suppose. Again, we have Wings used to cover things. Now, there is an instance later in the Bible where some angels have come with flaming swords to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And they are these people that are chosen to leave uh, go to leave, and they're like, don't turn around, do not look at us. If you look at us, you will turn to pillars of salt. So I think going back to seraphim, it's interesting that they would cover their eyes because maybe if you look at their eyes, maybe it's almost like a Gorgon or Medusa. You look at them and you turn to salt or stone, right? Interesting, interesting. So the angel's doing you a service by covering its own eyes with a pair of wings. Now, covering of the feet is interesting to me because feet on men uh, is talked about in the Bible because we're going on a tangent, but because it is seen as like something special for a woman to take her hair, which is her beauty, it's her essence, her value is in her hair. A lot of the times in the Bible, it is seen for her to use her tears and her hair to wash a man's feet. That raises issues of chauvinism and anti-feminism, but I digress. So I think it's interesting that the angels would cover their feet as well. And here we have angels covering their bodies. Essentially, I think the angels are covering themselves in different places because, again, it is dangerous to actually make contact with them like visually however people do that all the time in the bible <laughs> they will see angels and look at them but it's complicated maybe it's only with cherubims and seraphim maybe it's not with archangels who knows who knows the bible doesn't tell us anywho going back to descriptions um cherubim are accompanied by mysterious whirring wheels or wheels of fire and that's where again the images that you've seen come into play so, yeah, rings, whirring wheels of flame, not necessarily around their bodies or as their body, just off to the sides and around them, these spinning wheels, sometimes on fire, sometimes not. And because it's described a couple of times, like three times in um, the Bible, in Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. And there's these whirring wheels that emit a sound. Uh, it could be horrifying. It could be beautiful. We don't really know. They could be on fire. They might not be on fire. Angels, all three of these classes, are also described sometimes as having crowns of flame. Sometimes not. 
Sometimes the angels have instruments with them, like a harp uh, or a horn or a weapon like a sword. Sometimes not. So that's essentially it. Those are, uh, well, that's actually, that's a lie. There's a, a lot more detail that Ezekiel goes into, but I do encourage you to go re read that for yourself because it's a lot. Like I would be talking for a while if we went on and on about the specifics of how uh, cherubim look according to Ezekiel. Those are in Ezekiel's book, chapters 1 through 10, if you want to go look at that. Um, so yeah, cherubims do have special roles as well, much like the seraphim and the archangel. So a seraphim's job, after we get that lengthy description of their appearance, which is terrifying, like truly terrifying, their jobs are seen all the way back going to the Garden of Eden. So cherubs guard things. They are guardians. Okay. So cherubims expel Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after they, you know, sin by eating from the, the, the tree that was forbidden. And they are described as having flaming swords that guard the pathway to the tree of life, which is interesting. That's way back in the book of Genesis. Um, cherubims support God's throne. So they rest above the throne. So if seraphim are on the bottom of the throne, you know, they're supporting God, being his handmaid. Cherubims are above the throne as well, ready to take the word of God. Because again, all angels are messengers of God and warriors for God. So they've got to be there to be like, what you need? What's good? What do I got to go do? Um, <clears throat> and, oh, well, actually, like Seraphim, there is an instance where Cherephim does cast judgment on the behalf of God. So in Ezekiel chapter 10, a cherub hands a burning piece of coal to someone else. In Ezekiel's vision, though, um, who has... Um, done something sinful, which I think was murder, if I remember. Anyway, so they're handing this burning coal to a murderer being like, you, you, you for doing that. <laughs> um, but that could be symbolic. It was just in his vision. An angel didn't actually come down to earth and give a burning coal into the hands of a person, which would hurt. <laughs> um, now, given the description of a cherub, of them being, you know, kind of like a manticore, or like a satyr or something. Some people say, was the devil originally a cherub? Perhaps, perhaps. I mean, truly perhaps. Um, there, I made notes. So Ezekiel himself does refer to Satan as a cherub. I found that. And that is in Ezekiel 28, verses 11 through 19. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 11 through 19. He says that, uh, the, uh, that Lucifer was the anointed cherub. Um, and he describes him as someone who has been on the holy mountain of God. So, that makes sense in a couple of ways. Because, again, the appearance, right? If we want to ignore the fact that the church probably got that from many different Celtic gods and such. But I digress. That imagery of him being like a goat man. But if we want to ignore that, then the devil probably is a cherub. Because one, Ezekiel told us so. And he's a prophet of God. And he received a vision. Many visions from God. So if Ezekiel tells us that he was a cherub, he literally says he was an anointed cherub, then we have to take his word for it. It does describe his appearance, and it does describe the fact that we are told early on, I think in the book of Genesis, that Lucifer is one of God's right-hand men. So he could have been an archangel because he was so respected and close to God, or he may have been a cherub, which would still put him very close to God, literally at the throne of God, at his feet. So who knows? Um, who knows? I think it's important to note, too, wrapping up now, that angels are usually automatons. They're golems. And what I mean by that, our angels do not really seem to have free will at all. And I think that that's probably why many angels 
across the Abrahamic religions are usually described as lustful or jealous, specifically jealous and envious of mankind because we have free will and we are one of the, probably if not the only creation of God according to the Holy Bible that does have complete free will. We are not bound by anything, by urges, by you know, we don't have to live through an animal nature. We're not driven by that. We, we have free will to do anything we want. We can ignore our own animal instincts. Animals themselves cannot do that. They cannot ignore their instincts. We can. We have complete free will. And according to the Bible, we can infer, it doesn't specifically say, but we can infer from all of the actions of the angels that they do not have free will. They have to do what God tells them to do. They have to. They must enact God's will at every single turn, be it through enacting vengeance in his name when they destroy entire cities, they burn them to the ground in the name of God because those people were sinful or have offended God in some way. Um, they have to deliver messages and visions on God's behalf. They just have to do it. They have to protect God, take care of God, fight for God. It's very interesting. Now, I do want to say that guardian angels are not in the Bible. They're not. They're not name dropped in the Bible. That seems to be an invention from somewhere else, but we'll get into that in other videos. But in terms of Christianity and the Holy Bible itself, just reading purely from the text, guardian angels are not a thing. Now, there are instances where different types of angels, like cherubim and seraphim, uh, protect people in small instances, including Jesus. They protect them, including children as well, children and Jesus especially that I'm thinking of. Angels do come and protect uh, people from physical harm against them from another person. So in that sense, that is kind of a guardian angel, but there's really not like every person is assigned an angel and it watches over you and guides you. That's not really a thing in terms of the Holy Bible, but we'll get into that in another video. Now, uh, with that said, I hope that this piqued your interest about angels and about the truth behind angels because the truth when I say the truth the truth is just what's according to the Bible um, I interpret the Bible literally because that's that's all we have but also that's how I was taught uh, being raised in the Church of Christ you translate the Bible literally you if it's not in the Bible then it did not happen and it is not a part of Christianity according to the Church of Christ so that's just how I interpret it also I think it's important that before you start kind of inferring your own knowledge and judgments and your own interpretations of the Bible, learn what it is first. You know, learn what the rules are before you break them, right? That kind of thing. So just on paper, according to the Bible, that's what angels are. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. And if you liked this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and book a reading with me over on Facebook. And comment down below what your thoughts are about angels what you want to see next from me about angels. The next video I probably will make in this series is going to be about angels through a Jewish perspective. And then from there we'll go on to Muslim perspectives, etc, etc. And they're very different <laughs> in each Abrahamic faith. Um, but that is, that is the Protestant view of angels. You know, perhaps next we'll do the Catholic version before we move on to Jewish. We'll see. We'll see. Anywho, thank you so much and goodbye.